Today, I want to talk about uh, J.B. Fitzmorris and the cartoons that he produced uh, during the First World War. This is something that I have um, researched a fair bit in, in the last few years, and I, um, I've actually created a website that, I'll, uh, that I will um, kind of give you a link to uh, uh, a little later on. The cartoon that you see in, in the image that I have up there is of Fitzmorris. It's a, it's a caricature of himself <laughs> coming back to Vancouver in the summer of 1916. And uh, he had been in Montreal for a number of years. And so he came back to Vancouver. He had been here earlier before the war. And then from the summer of 1916, right up until the end, he produced uh, a about 650 cartoons that were related specifically to uh, to the war, uh, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about those for you tonight. The first thing, though, that I'd like to do is uh, just uh, give you a little bit of background on uh, Fitzmorris himself, uh, James Bryan Fitzmorris, um, known as J. B. Fitzmorris, and quite often just referred to as Fitz, which I will quite a bit tonight. Um, he was born in the southern part of England, in and around the community of Bath, either in 1875 or 1876. It's not clear. It's, it's a little bit up in the air, but one of those years. At the age of 16, he decided to leave uh, Britain and traveled to Canada, and he labored in a number of places. We don't know everywhere where he uh, was working, mostly as a laborer, but we do know that he was working um, on some ranches in southern Alberta, and then eventually onto the Coldstream Ranch, of course, in the Okanagan Valley region. Fitz drifted into uh, Vancouver around 1900, and he worked in a number of areas in the Vancouver area. He uh, was working in a sawmill. He was clearing some building lots. Uh, he was doing house painting as well, and he also began to work part-time writing and drawing sidewalk show cards for local theater houses in Vancouver, of course, vaudeville houses. And it's actually doing that work when he was doing sort of cartoons on these show cards where he started to make a connection uh, with the province newspaper uh, and its editorial staff. Uh, uh, particularly, I should say, the sports editor, uh, James Hewitt. Uh, he was the sports editor at, um, at the Vancouver province, uh, and, and Fitz made a, a close friendship with Hewitt at that time. I'll just add here <laughs> that James Hewitt <laughs> was the uncle of Foster Hewitt, the radio broadcaster and play-by-play -play man, uh, original one for Hockey Night in Canada. Anyway, um, and unfortunately, James Hewitt went, uh, went into the war uh, in 1914, and he lost his life uh, overseas. Um, however, uh, doing this and making these contacts, the province hired Fitzmorris as a full-time staff cartoonist and illustrator in January of 1908. Now, Fitzmorris would go on to produce two years of front page cartoons, sports section cartoons. So th those are the ones that I originally saw quite often. Uh, illustrations in the paper and advertisements in the province. So he was very much a general, uh, a general illustrator and cartoonist. Um, he did leave Vancouver and moved to Eastern Canada, and I, I believe he was also in um, the Eastern United States uh, in 1910. And I, and I have a feeling he was looking uh, for greater status in larger cities uh, with larger daily newspapers. Um, and perhaps he was interested in getting syndicated through one of the emerging newspaper syndication firms, right? like George Matthew Adams Services or 
or the, the New York Tribune and, and these syndication firms. They were just sort of emerging at that time. What we do know is that Fitz worked for several years for the Montreal Herald. Um, and he did produce cartoons there, but unfortunately we don't have any, well, only a handful of those cartoons that fell into individual hands because the archives of the, of the, um, of the paper actually burnt down in the interwar years. So, so we just don't have those, which is unfortunate. Now, for reasons that are not clear as well, uh, Fitzmaurice returned to Vancouver um, and the province newspaper in the summer of 1916. So right in the midst of the First World War. Uh, Fitz became a core contributor to the Vancouver province from that point onwards uh, for 10 years from 1916 until his sudden death of a heart attack in 1926 at the age of uh, 51. Now, over that period, um, he produced around 2,100 cartoons. Uh, and the majority of these actually appeared on the front page of the newspaper. So he was enormously influential uh, as a journalist because of the images that he, he produced. I happen to have them all. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I might not have all of them, but I have pretty much all of them because that was one of my kind of my hobbies was when I was doing research on other things, I would, I would, you know, scan the, the cartoons in the paper. Now, some of the best uh, of these images were produced, I believe, during the First World War, and that's when Fitz became quite well known in Vancouver and, and very much loved by uh, most Vancouverites. Um, I thought I'd show you this. This is just a, this is just a picture of, um, of a typical microfilm, you know, archival version of the newspaper. I'm quite sure that there's a lot of people sitting in the Zoom meeting tonight who have gone through papers and have seen this. You know, they're, they're, um, this, is what, this is what you see, right? And this is where his cartoon would have been sitting in the newspaper, usually in the center. Uh, of, of the front page. Um, and, and of course, it's on a microfilm. So, um, so my job was to, you know, scan this or photograph this, and then I would um, digitally uh, scan it if in the early years I didn't use digital scanning. Uh, so I would scan it and then I would actually clean up the cartoon. <laughs> so, so I actually, actually spent like, hours and hours and hours on each cartoon, sort of cleaning it up and getting rid of a lot of the, the uncleanliness of, of the cartoon. So the ones that I'm going to show you tonight um, all have that, um, that uh, digital cleaning done of them. Now, just before we start, I'd like to just say a few words about reading old political cartoons. You know, this is something that I, I had to investigate. Um, there's a number of different approaches to reading um, old political cartoons and trying, you know, to try and generate the meaning from them. One of these approaches, of course, is something that I'm sure most of you recognize, and that is that these images have both intended and unintended meanings in them, right? And um, the intended meanings, of course, refer to the messages that are consciously proposed by the creator of the cartoon itself. So these are the overt meanings uh, that were intended by the artist. Um, those meanings uh, take a long time to, uh, to research, <laughs> um, right? You know, you have to investigate and there's lots of cartoons that Fitzmaurice produced that had very, very, uh, you know, unusual uh, themes to them. And so I, I actually had to hunt them down in the newspapers themselves. And then there are, of course, the unintended meanings. These are the meanings that historians identify within the cartoons, uh, which were not like consciously intended as the core message by the artist. But these meanings, of course, 
uh, reflect the values, beliefs, the social structures, um, attitudes of the historical context being being examined. And, and of course, this is an area that a lot of historians, social and cultural historians, spend a lot of uh, time uh, looking at. Now, another way to read political cartoons that has been emphasized in recent years by cultural studies scholars is to identify the structures of what we call visual rhetoric used by the artist to deliver the, the uh, intended messages of the cartoon, right? And so these are like the graphic uh, and artistic tricks and uh, narrative forms that were generally used by political cartoonists in this period. And, um, and on the slide here, I've identified three key ones that um, Fitzmaurice used uh, almost all the time. The first is condensation. This means the compression of the complex into a single embodiment, right? So this is where, of course, they would use um, allegorical figures like Uncle Sam. Um, you know, uh, like uh, Madame Canada, like John Bull to represent uh, Britain, right? Um, they'd also use personifications. And so this is where they would have a figure there that represented an idea, a position, a policy, whatever, an action, right? And we'll see those in some of the cartoons. And then finally, they all, he also used uh, for condensation representative individuals. So these were actual historical figures, but they usually represented something more uh, or different than the figure specifically uh, was at that time. The second important tool of visual rhetoric is domestication. This is the placement of... Um, foreign and sophisticated concepts, uh, issues, uh, people, right, into very familiar, commonplace, ordinary situations. Uh, so, and Fitzmaurice used this a lot. He would place his political leaders, you know, in a family household, in a, in a common workplace, um, in, in, in a familiar street scene. And then finally, opposition. Uh, and this is the reduction of all public issues into binary opposites, right? And, and I have to say, almost all political cartoonists did this back then, and many of them still do today, right? So you, you reduce everything down to two sides, right? The right side and the wrong side. The good side, the bad side the winners, the losers, right? And, um, and so when you look at these cartoons, everything is kind of reduced down, down to that. Um, incidentally, the cartoon that I have here, and I can zoom in on it here for you, <laughs> is, uh, was produced um, during his first period in Vancouver. I, I can't remember, I think this is from 1909. And of course, Wilfrid Laurier, the Liberal Prime Minister uh, at the time, um, was hated by the province because the province was a strong supporter of both uh, the Federal Conservative Party and the Provincial Conservative Party. So, so Fitzmaurice produced, um, my, my goodness, I think over a hundred cartoons with, with um, Wilfrid Laurier in them. And of course, he was always making fun of Wilfrid Laurier and criticizing liberal policy. Um, so you can see uh, uh, Laurier here dressed up as, a, um, as, a, as an entertainment figure, <laughs> right? Uh, a ballerina. You can see that uh, he or they, I suppose we should say, is wearing the Laurier policy tutu. And then down at the bottom, oh, by the way, he's putting on his face uh, honesty powder, um, uh, in integrity rouge, and uh, election promises, right? These are all the fakeages that um, conservatives believed about Laurier. And then down at the bottom, uh, a lovely little thing that Fitzmaurice has written, little puffs of powder, little pots of paint, make the chorus lady 
look like what she ain't. <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, over um, um, the 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 website that I've created, um, which the link is down at the bottom there, the URL robinanderson.open.ca. Um, this is actually uh, a website I created that has an extensive um, uh, kind of study of Fitzmaurice's wartime cartoons. And this is, this is basically the table of contents of the website. Um, and this reflects what I believed was the structure of structural meaning of his, um, of his cartoons. So half of the cartoons that you look at here are on the war in Europe. And here Fitzmaurice um, focuses on um, Fitz and the Kaiser, which we'll talk about tonight. Fitz and John Bull, where he uh, looks into British uh, developments during the war. And Fitz and Uncle Sam, where he produced quite a number of car uh, cartoons um, from the fall of 1916, during the period, of course, of American neutrality, which he rejected. <laughs> and, uh, and then when the United States joined the war in April 1917. And then um, the war at home, uh, that's the second. And, um, and uh, those cartoons are focused on um, um, Vancouverites um, supporting, uh, supporting the war from the home front. Now, what I thought we would do uh, tonight, I've just highlighted it in red, is have a look at Fitz and the Kaiser. <laughs> uh, so these are the anti-German cartoons. Uh, Fitz fights the war at home, and then Fitz gets the Kaiser's goat. Okay. All right. Um, Fitz and the Kaiser. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, the, um, the leading monarch in Germany during the war, and had been so in Germany from uh, uh, 1888 onwards. Um, Kaiser was really the star of Fitzmaurice's World War I cartoons. Uh, between 1916 and the end of 1918, he produced around 74 of these cartoons that featured Kaiser Wilhelm in them. This one that you see in front of you is called Hunted, <laughs> produced in the spring of 1917. Um, I will say, even though he produced all these cartoons, the real Kaiser Wilhelm was not the neo-absolutist person portrayed in these images. Um, in fact, most historians on the First World War and those that have focused on Germany have said that uh, Wilhelm, actually his uh, authority grew in the 1890s, but by the turn of the century, it started to decline. Uh, so his authority and his control actually went into a certain amount of decline from 1900s onwards. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why historians talk about that decline. Certainly part of it is because of the growth of a modern, um, complex, industrialized German society, and there was a need then for overlapping authorities within that um, large society. But also with the outbreak of World War II, this led to the need for wartime expertise and technical knowledge and, of course, military authorities. So during the war itself, yes, the Kaiser could have the last word on things, but in large part, he was not really the authority, certainly not the control, not the manager of the war effort for Germany. Um, however, the role of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was huge in all allied cartoons, right? Um, in part because of the lack of understanding by journalists at the time of uh, Germany's social and political structures, but also because of the Kaiser's bombastic reputation and his physical public persona that he had built up through the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. You know, this was a man with outward flamboyancy. I have another lovely 
cartoon picture of him there. Um, very, very flamboyant. Uh, he was constantly putting on martial displays, right? There was a lot of public strutting that was happening. And of course, the way he looked was very identifiable, particularly the waxed handlebar mustache, right? So the Kaiser actually was the central villain in uh, most Allied newspapers and magazine cartoons right through World War I. Uh, British cartoonists, famous ones like F.H. Townsend or Bernard Partridge, Frank Reynolds, those guys all drew for punch, of course. Uh, Jack Walker for the Daily Graphic and uh, Edmund Sullivan, who was a freelance illustrator and probably the greatest uh, cartoonist, political cartoonist of the era. Most of these British images of the Kaiser were very serious. They were filled with anger and hate, and the Kaiser was portrayed as evil and satanic. These were not funny cartoons. Well, one of the best examples of it, I don't have a picture here for you, was Edmund Sullivan's little, little booklet that he put out in 1915 called The Kaiser's Garland, right? That is just full of these hateful images of the Kaiser. Now, having said that, probably the darkest images of Germany and the Kaiser were produced by a Dutch cartoonist during World War I by the name of Louis Raymaker. Uh, these images were extreme propaganda against, uh, against Germany. Um, Fitzmaurice's Kaiser cartoons were much milder, <laughs> um, less serious, um, more comic in their presentation. The emphasis was through most of these was on the visual rhetoric tool of domestication. In other words, he placed the Kaiser in commonly experienced settings. Here's a nice example, a cartoon produced in January of 1917 called Hates to Pay the Price. Here, I'll just sort of focus in on it for, whoa, what did I do? Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, as you can see in this picture, the Kaiser is presented as a father struggling with the cost of ending the war outside the Allies' peach, peace shop. His son, who is identified as the German people, wants peace and is unhappy with the earlier toy gift that he was given by his father down at the bottom a ball on, on, on a rope called the promises of victory <laughs> or the promise of victory, right? Um, note that the price of peace uh, attached to the dove in the peace shop is unconditional surrender. So um, Fitzmaurice blamed the war uh, not on the German people. In fact, he seldom blamed the war on on the German people. Most of his cartoons presented, in fact, a wide gulf between the German people and their illegitimate leadership, represented in all of these cartoons by Kaiser Wilhelm. So Kaiser, the Kaiser represents the German regime in these, these images. Um, but Fitz maintained his position that was certainly in place probably throughout Canada by 1915, that German unconditional surrender was the only allowable outcome of the war. Um, and so the paper was really supporting that, you know, negotiating peace was not uh, in, the, in the minds of a lot of um, media at that time, a, a solution to the war, um, at least not in popular conventional media. And the juxtaposition of placing major historical figures in these banal settings was a fundamental basis for the humor. In other words, that's, that's what's funny about these cartoons. It's not the themes, it's the domestication built into them. Um, 
Here's another cartoon. Must get a new excuse. <laughs> uh, here I will uh, zoom in on this one as well. <laughs> this is another image based on um, domestication. Fitz plays with uh, the tension arising from marital conflict in this image. Um, as we see here, a badly roughed up husband, Wilhelm, returns home after a rollicking night out, and he offers an excuse for his condition to his frustrated spouse, who's titled Germania at the bottom of her dress there. <laughs> Germania actually appeared in a, a number of times in Fitz's World War I cartoons. Uh, she sports a, a lot of the anti-ethnic um, German stereotypes that were portrayed, particularly in British um, uh, media culture at that time, including, of course, the sausage necklace around her neck and the, the sausage ear pieces, too. Fitz's uh, propaganda message in this cartoon is that German military strategies are ineffective and will lead to German defeat. Now, what's interesting about this is that this cartoon was produced early in 1917 when there were real worries about the Allies' ability to win the war. Um, and so a lot of these cartoons about the inability of Germany to win the war emerged uh, often when the Allied fortunes took a turn for the worse, right? Or when the British and, ca and Canadian casualties started to spike. So what that tells us, of course, is that these cartoons were always meant to raise morale, right? And to deliver propaganda. They were not to provide accurate war information uh, for the public. There's a colorized version of it. <laughs> I know that there's probably some archivists sitting out there looking at this, shaking their heads in anger, you know. But, um, but I've actually started to embrace colorizing uh, these cartoons. And in fact, my stepdaughter, has, uh, who's very good digitally, has been doing some of these. And, and I kind of like it. <laughs> All right. As the tide uh, of war began to turn in the summer of 1918 and the Allies entered the, the what we call the last hundred days that saw real gains on the Western Front, Fitzmaurice's Kaiser Wilhelm started to appear in a series of imminent disaster cartoons. Um, these images uh, presented the death, not of the real Kaiser, but of the German regime and its political and social ideals, which the allegorical Kaiser in these images represented, right? Here's one of them called William Will Stay with the Ship. This was actually produced near the end of the war, October of 1918. Fitz used the sea disaster in a handful of cartoons to symbolize the end of the war and the defeat of central powers. And here we see Kaiser and an allegorical Germany floating beside him there, uh, adrift and clinging to ship degree, which is dubbed uh, Ho Hohenzollern uh, autocracy there that they're hanging on to. In other words, the German regime, right? Um, and Germany, our, our you know, allegorical figure of Germany decides to accept the rescue from the Allies, uh, which of course is a uh, complete surrender, right? Um, while Kaiser Wilhelm, of course, and the values he represents are left to go down with the ship. Here's another one, the situation is grave. Uh, this one was produced uh, a few weeks before the other one we just looked at, so in September of 1918. Um, that quote, the situation was grave, was actually um, uh, the Chancellor of Germany at the time, uh, George von Hertling, uh, had said that about German, the German condition at that time. This is another end of the war 
image that pictures uh, the Kaiser fallen into an open grave marked, here lies Hohenzollernism, right? The family. As the Allies, confident in their victory, bury the Kaiser and his regime alive. The Kaiser says, I'm not dead yet. The Allies say, why worry? You soon will be. <laughs> A bit Monty Python-ish there, I think. Anyway. Of course, uh, this was somewhat true in terms of the fall of the German regime and its reconstruction after the war, the rise of the Weimar Republic. But this was completely untrue of, of Wilhelm himself. Uh, he was abdicated, um, pushed out of his position in November of 1918, but then he was exiled to neutral Holland to live out the rest of his life. And he didn't die until he was 82 years old in 1941. Um, now, I'm not going to go into detail on these other um, Fitz uh, and the War in Europe cartoons, um, but I will say that, um, that he does spend, um, you know, several dozen cartoons looking at British policy changes. Uh, in 1916 and 1970, he looks at the rise of David Lord George as the Prime Minister of, um, of Britain in December of 1916. Um, and then, of course, and, and when he does this, he uses John Bull as one of his key allegorical figures there. John Bull represented Great Britain's, uh, the, the people of Great Britain. And then, of course, he also produced a lot of uh, cartoons on, uh, on American wartime policy. Um, so I, I kind of put these into the category of Fitz and Uncle Sam because he uses Uncle Sam in a lot of them. He also, of course, uh, uses Woodrow Wilson, the American uh, president during the war. And uh, most of his cartoons on, on American developments look at American neutrality. Uh, which Fitzmaurice is quite negative about. And then finally, of course, the United States entry into the war in April of 1917. And this was one of the more powerful images he had when the United States declared war on Germany. And as you can see in the bottom, see there is Kaiser Wilhelm and there's Uncle Sam. And, um, and then at the bottom, you know, it says, a nation speaks and acts. Right. And so it fits Morris and indeed uh, the Vancouver province was very powerfully behind uh, uh, the United States joining the war effort. Now, um, what I want to look at now are the war uh, are, are the war at home cartoons that he did. So the cartoons that were focused on Vancouver life. Um, I'll just uh, zoom in here. <laughs> This is actually a cartoon whose title I don't have on there that's called The Perfect Patriot, produced in the spring of 1918. And, uh, and this in uh, Fitzmaurice's eyes was what the um, home front citizen needed to do for the war, right? So as you can see, I am supporting a hen. I grow my own potatoes. I never enter a bar. I own a victory bond. I voted in favor of prohibition. I pressed my own clothes, et cetera, right? Um, and uh, so he, he, he actually produced a huge number of cartoons that presented life on the home front. Um, most of these cartoons were produced from the spring of 1917 right up until the end of the war. And while many of these cartoons promoted home front support for the war effort, a large number of them actually mocked life on the home front. Um, so they weren't as strongly propaganda delivered and designed as his other cartoons were. And, and he also began to introduce a very different style and tone to the images that he had. Um, now, the first images that I'd like to show you um, are Fitz's front page cartoons to promote civilian support um, for the war at home. 
and these do have these do have a fairly strong propaganda uh, feature to them. Um, Fitz produced dozens of images promoting wartime special causes and charities in Vancouver. One of the events that was held many times in downtown Vancouver were tag days, right? Where wartime charities, both local and national charities would, would set, up, uh, set up a booths on the street, um, like the Red Cross and other organizations. Um, and, um, and they would canvas, of course, Vancouverites for their contributions uh, to the war effort. So people would give money to whatever the charities were. And the contributors would get a tag that they could put on their jacket or on their shirt or on their hat, right? Um, and of course, these were th these people would collect these as, to demonstrate how much support they gave for the war effort. So it was a proof of their donation and a sense of, of pride for a lot of uh, a lot of people in Vancouver. Now, the largest number of home front cartoons were uh, Fitzmorris's Victory Bond promotion cartoon. Um, now, a little bit of background here. The Victory Bonds were uh, technically referred to as a debt security program <laughs> aimed at the public to help finance expenditures during the war. There were, in fact, six Victory Bond programs in Canada from 1915 until the end uh, of the sixth one, which actually ended at the end of 1919. And each one of these um, um, Victory Bond programs actually raised more money than the previous one. So these were actually enormously successful. Um, here's a great Victory Bond uh, cartoon here, Duty Calls, right? Um, this is actually shaped, this cartoon is taking on the shape of a recruitment promotion advertisement, right? In fact, there were soldier recruitment posters for the Canadian Expeditionary Force that were produced that looked just like this, right? There'd be a father, there'd be a son, and there'd be a poster of uh, encouraging recruitment um, for the war effort, right? But this, of course, is he takes that that uh, structure to produce a victory bond uh, promotion. So um, we see here, you know, the father saying, "My boy, it is your duty." That's patriotic Canada, and his his son is actually Canada's eligible wealth, <laughs> who says, "Dad, I want to join up." Right. So buy a bond then beat the Bosch. Um, and the 1917 Victory Bond uh, program uh, and the, uh, was, um, was used in that way as an equivalent to fighting the war overseas. Um, now, Fitzmorris also, around this time, um, at the beginning of 1917, began to uh, produce multiple panel images in his wartime cartoons. And we refer to these images as vignette cartoons. In these vignette cartoons, there was as many as three, four, five, in some cases, six separate vignettes that comically looked at the same topic in the cartoon. And there was, and I should say there was there was hardly ever a, a, a forward chronological narrative in these. You could look at each one of these separately uh, in the cartoons. Um, these are the cartoons, apparently, that most people remembered from World War I were these vignette cartoons, not the single image propaganda cartoons. Here's one that came out in September of 1917, called The Space the Committee Overlooked. All of the people in this cartoon are well-dressed, white, uh, urbanites from a rather privileged upper middle-class background. 
except for the Italian peddler at the top there who's saying, I wonder if she got a the peddler's license, you know, because she's she's promoting on the street to buy victory bonds, right? Uh, which kind of reflects, you know, the Anglo supremacy, the ethnic inequity that certainly lives rather commonly through Fitzmorris's cartoons. Here's another one. Everybody talk bonds. Um, this was produced uh, actually in October of 1918, uh, so towards the end of the war. So this would have been a promotional uh, cartoon for the 1918 Victory Bond program. Each image here presents a separate comic moment. Uh, I'll kind of zoom in for us here. So at the top there, we have, of course, the, uh, the dentist. <laughs> Uh, trying to encourage interest uh, in getting your patient to uh, buy bonds. And uh, across from that, of course, the barber, who's trying to encourage um, his client to buy victory bonds. And then right in the middle, of course, a restaurant situation, steer the conversation into the victory bond uh, channels. And then the ones on the outside at the bottom uh, are, um, are on the street. And that was very common for Fitzmorris. I, I will say the one on the right-hand side is quite interesting. Uh, she says uh, to, uh, I'm assuming her husband, of course, I am not a human fly, Hector, am I? But if that man could climb all up there for a bond, we can certainly buy one over a counter. <laughs> Right, And in fact, what she's referring to uh, is Harry Gardner, who was um, had the nickname the Human Fly. He was an American stunt performer who climbed the outsides of windows, right? And he began doing this for charitable organizations, right? So kind of an entertainment device to raise charity. And he actually did this in the fall of 1918 in Vancouver to raise money for the, uh, for the Vancouver uh, bond, Victory Bond program. Uh, and apparently he climbed uh, the Vancouver World Building, what would become the Sun Tower, in front of almost 10,000 people in order to raise uh, money for the Victory Bond program. Interesting. Um, so finally, uh, I, I want to look at what uh, I believe are Fitzmaurice's best cartoons. These are certainly uh, his funniest. In fact, they're a little bit crazy. These were cartoons that focused on the urbanites in Vancouver and their building of uh, the wartime victory gardens and animal stock raising in their backyards. Um, now, these cartoons certainly were promotional. They were there to encourage wartime food production. Uh, so they do have a propaganda intention to them. But they also made great fun of the efforts of middle-class urban Vancouverites. Uh, now, a little bit of background here. Um, the impact of government controls over wartime home fronts really kicked in. Uh, towards the end of 1917. Uh, there was food rationing and food controls, and these were important areas of government wartime management, uh, especially in the summer of 1917, when the federal government appointed William Hanna as the food controller in Canada. So he was in charge of making sure that all civilians in Canada supported the war effort by growing food in their backyards. <laughs> and he controlled other food production as well. Um, part of this policy meant the creation of provincial wartime committees to oversee food conservation and food production initiatives within each province. So in uh, British Columbia, the BC Food Control Committee was created in September of 1917. And uh, incidentally, Frank uh, Westbrook, the president of the recently created 
University of British Columbia was actually the chair of this committee. And there were four members of the board who were faculty from UBC's agricultural college as well. Um, so wartime controls and food production in British Columbia did take on a kind of uh, scientific and formalized set of features. Uh, and they were all driven by what uh, we can identify today as professional authority and scientific understandings of food production. Um, one of the key goals of this, of course, was to encourage urban dwellers to use their backyards, to grow their own food, and to participate in animal stock raising in their backyards for local consumption, right? Um, and Fitzmorris used all of this for comic purposes extensively over the last year of the war. Um, here's a lovely cartoon that is, of course, colorized, but it, it helps kind of us identify parts of it, uh, approved by the food controller. This, was, uh, this cartoon appeared in February of 1918. This is a single frame image that's filled with humor, right? <laughs> um, you know, our, our central character there, Mr. Everyman, is walking down the center of his backyard saying, I certainly do love this pastoral life. And as you can see, we have a milkery, we have a piggery, we have a henery, we have a doggery, we even have a human habitationary up there, right? Um, so everything is labeled and way over organized. And of course, that was um, a core of, of Fitzmaurice's humor. I will point out also at the bottom here the neighbor who happens to be feeding his pig a lovely dinner plate as well. So this is a model wartime backyard lot, according to Fitzmaurice. Um, now the comic juxtaposition of all of these cartoons is the combining of the quite uncomfortable mixing of earthy realities of rural and agricultural life with the unavoidable tendencies of refined middle-class urbanity, right? And that's really, that's, that's the humor that builds a lot of these cartoons. Here's another one. The scientific method of dealing with garden pests from uh, February of 1918. I shall zoom in. <laughs> uh, this is full of humorous moments in it, very funny. Um, of course, it's another single frame cartoon filled with outrageous humor. Um, I will say, while Canadian soldiers, of course, had become used to gas attacks on the Western Front, citizens on the home front were just preparing to launch their own chemical wars in their backyards. Uh, using liberal and lethal doses of chemical insecticide on garden pests, right? And this family that he has in this actually appear in many subsequent cartoons. Uh, and this is filled with jokes. For instance, the father is saying, the beets don't seem to be growing. And the mother says, perhaps they're dead beets. <laughs> And their daughter behind them says, oh, father, are you sure Horace has his gas mask on? Uh, Horace is a, a pig. And I'm going to talk about Horace in some detail um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, I will also add, by the way, their neighbor is gassing birds. So he's, he's actually gassing birds in his backyard. Um, Fitzmaurice loved to make fun of urbanites and their complete inability to turn their backyards into productive farms. Whether or not that was true is, is, is not clear. <laughs> but certainly Fitzmaurice played with the humor that it's impossible. 
Um, here's a cartoon called Lessons from the Retired Farmer. And, uh, and there were a couple of events that were held in Vancouver where farmers came in from the rural areas, from the Fraser Valley, and would come in and talk to people, urbanites, about farming in their backyard during the war. The urban male uh, in these cartoons is characterized as physically inept, sorely lacking in common sense, and out of touch with the physical roots of their existence. Uh, as you can see here, the advanced hoeing course. Uh, and then down at the bottom, the freshman vegetable identification course. Um, and you can see here the, the subordinate everyman on the ground trying to identify the plants that they're growing. Um, and the one on the right at the bottom says, um, am I right in designating this growth as a spinach professor? Uh, to which the retired farmer bluntly replies, you can tell a carrot from an onion because they look different. Hence the juxtaposition of urban life from the realities of farm life. Again, this was the comic heart of Fitzmaurice's wartime garden uh, cartoons. Now, finally, um, sometime early in 1918, uh, Fitzmaurice and his family acquired a pig. Uh, the pig's name was Horace. Uh, before the end of April that year, the family also bought a goat, and her name was Annie. Both of these animals were kept in their South Vancouver backyard as part of the Food Controllers Initiative. And uh, this initiative was, in, in, in terms of mottos, was to keep a patriotic pig or get a Kaiser's goat, right? So between January of 1918 and the end of the war, Fitzmorris produced over 40 cartoons that starred Horace the Pig and Annie the Goat. All of these cartoons consciously revealed the modern urban contradictions of animals as food versus animals as pets. <laughs> what Fitz referred to in one of his cartoons as Pig as pet, pig as pork. Um, now, this theme, by the way, has been taken up uh, recently by contemporary scholars, uh, not just in history, but in a range of social um, uh, studies disciplines. Um, and, and we start to see actually an emerging field of human, non-human animal relations. Uh, in academic life. And in fact, the history of, um, of uh, man's relationship with animals has really started to emerge as an important area of study. Um, that, that contradiction, uh, the, the co cognitive dissonance, as they say, between animals as food and animals as pets is referred to within this um, field of study as carnism or the pet meat gap. <laughs> um, and his cartoons, I have to say, really do reflect uh, this contradiction. Here's a good one. When society goes in for raising patriotic pigs, produced in December of 1917. So he actually produced this cartoon before he acquired Horace, the pig. Um, and as we can see in this image, I will zoom in. As we can see in this image in the various uh, vignettes, um, we can see the pigs replacing mostly dogs, right? Uh, so the first two, of course, the, the pig is on a leash in those. Uh, and then down the one on the left-hand side. Oh, I say, he says, hold Fifi for a minute, will you, Percy? Uh, 
right? They're taking them. And then the one on the on, on the right hand corner at the bottom there, we're actually seeing the pig replacing children. Uh, the mother says, uh, don't go far, I'm afraid it may rain. And Horace has a nasty cold. And the nanny says, yes, ma'am, as Horace uh, squeals out the grand opera. Um, here's a, here is another one. This is one of my favorite Fitzmorris wartime cartoons. When it comes to killing the family pig, produced in February of 1918. This really centers around the emotional crisis that an urban family would have in slaughtering the animals that are living in their yards. Um, this cartoon overtly represents the contradictions of that peat, uh, pardon me, pet meat paradox. Um, all sorts of images in here emphasize that emotional crisis as people are unable to deal with this. My favorite scene is at the dinner table at the bottom. The father says, I don't think Horace is as tender as Peter was. May I help you to a little more? And his daughter sitting in the middle says, father, and his wife at the end, how can you be so brutal, Harold? Yes, I'll have a small slice, please. <laughs> the Fitzmaurice family actually uh, kept their two animals um, and never, uh, never slaughtered Horace, as far as I know, from what I can tell. Maybe they did. Uh, but they certainly had Horace and Annie the goat for a number of years after the war ended. Um, and in fact, uh, in those years, Fitzmaurice uh, would appear in a lot of public events. He'd do uh, public appearances and what were called chalk talks, right? Where he would talk about the war experience and display some of his best known wartime cartoons in those. And here's a cartoon that appeared after he uh, went to the Rotary Club to do his presentation. Um, Horace and Annie accompanied him to these events on most occasions. So he would drag the pig, <laughs> who must have been large by that point, and Annie into these events, right? And for this reason, and because of the power of Fitzmaurice's wartime cartoons and the, the gentle humor of these cartoons, he was a widely remembered uh, wartime figure, a, a man who was really a central, one of the central uh, figures in terms of Vancouver's experience on the home front. Um, now, finally, this is the last cartoon I will show you. Uh, this was produced actually just before the war ended called War Monuments for Civilians. And uh, here Fitzmaurice embraces the humor of monuments for um, Vancouver citizens who contributed to the war effort. So at the top on the left-hand side, a monument that says, he made one potato grow where none grew before. <laughs> the one beside it, he coughed up. Hmm. Uh, and then that, of course, is about uh, contributing to the war effort in terms of tag day. Uh, the one in the middle, they knitted all they knew, right? And of course, met women did knit socks for soldiers overseas during the war. Uh, the one at the bottom on the left-hand side, lay on, you know? because people had a lot of chickens as well in their backyards for the war effort. Uh, believe me, hens were poultry in those days, as he said. And then of course, my favorite image on the right-hand side, the Horace Monument. The man at the bottom says, I tell you, pigs were pork in those days. And she says, yes, also sausages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Just before, uh, uh, and thank you for letting me speak about this. I do want to just remind you <laughs> that I am in the process of um, creating a website. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not very good at website production, uh, but I will say that this website uh, is full of information and has around 120 cartoons posted in it. <laughs> um, and as, uh, as I had shown you, the, um, the cartoons are divided up into pages. Um, so I do encourage you, uh, if you have the time, uh, to go have a look. It's free. You can just go in and have a look, OK? All right, thank you again. Robin, thank you very, very much. And uh, if we can have the, the kind of virtual round of applause for, uh, for Robin. And uh, <laughs> Robin, if you can, um, well, you know, you can leave your screen up there for the moment. I don't see any reason um, why not. And uh, sure. there are a few questions that have come in if you've uh, got a moment to consider them. Okay. Um, one is how Fitz's cartoons, he defined a kind of a British Columbian, and you can see in these characters, the, the owners of the pigs and, and so on, that it seems to be somehow different from a Canada or, or a Britain in the wider world. Do you see him as a kind of a populist or um, like a early version of, let's say, W.A.C. Bennett or something like that. He was never in politics. But, uh, well, you know, Bennett, Bennett was fairly conservative. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and Fitzmore, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we would identify him necessarily as inherently conservative in his outlook. He did work for a conservative a paper that supported the Conservative Party. Um, well, uh, uh, certainly during the war, um, he produced no cartoons that featured um, Canada's participation in the war. Huh? Um, you know, like like my website there, you know, the, the war overseas was seen as, you know, Britain, the United States, and Germany, right? In other words, um, to a certain extent, he saw Canada as part of the British in Empire. So, so we we might identify him as an Im British imperialist. But having said that, a lot of his cartoons on Britain really did pre present them as separate from um, from the viewer, right? And so, I think he did embrace British Columbia as his sense of uh, identity. Um, and now, I, I just I don't want to go into too much detail here, but this was probably driven, at least in part, by the fact that um, in 1908 and 1909, in his first uh, period as a cartoonist, um, he he made tons of cartoons that supported British Columbia, and of course its conservative provincial government, um, and and were uh, profoundly critical and against the Canadian federal government. And so in a way that may have set down a, um, a tendency on his part to see his connection to British Columbia and not to Canada as, as, as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then this, this all might also kind of connect to the fact that Canadian national identity, particularly in Western Canada was not very strong before World War I, um, Canadian nationalism does start to take greater strength and greater roots during the war. And, you know, those are all of us here who teach Canadian history usually identified the war as a, an important turning point in Canadian national identity and things like that. But honestly, we don't see that in his cartoons. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think I think I think that's probably the reason for that. Did he have were there timely issues of the day that he uh, that he avoided, particularly um, because of working for a conservative paper or? Oh yeah, no. I well, I don't know. I'd I'd have to I'd have to think about that a little bit more. I'm sure there's lots of them um, that he avoided. I do know that in terms of the war. In terms of the war effort, 
he 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 completely avoided a lot of controversies that happened during the war. Uh, I mean, Sam Hughes, right? Who was <laughs> who was Canada's minister of militia uh, from the start of the war? He became a problem <laughs> and uh, quite an annoying personality. And of course, uh, the the prime minister ha had to had to dismiss him in the fall of 1916. Fitz, none of that entered into Fitzmaurice's cartoon, so that's kind of un unusual. Um, Fitzmaurice does reflect some of the growth of the wartime state, right, and controls over the economy. So there's some cartoons where he kind of does talk about the, the emergence of a controlled government during, during wartime, but really not a lot. Um, there's nothing in his cartoons on the conscription crisis in 1917. Hmm. That was the one, of the, uh, one of the other questions that came in about, uh, about con conscription, other controversial domestic issues about uh, yeah. getting the vote, about suffrage. Yes, he does. And I do have, uh, if you go onto the website, you can look the, at one of the pages um, where I look at women getting the vote during World War I and his cartoons on that. Um, and I combine that with looking at the, um, uh, at, the um, uh, at Prohibition. So it's kind of the politics of women and drink as portrayed through his cartoons. Uh, they're really, really good. They're really, really interesting. Um, he's really, really anti-female in his positioning on that. He's not against um, the act, you know, the, 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 the passage of, 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 uh, of women's rights to vote, but he's quite against women holding political office. Um, and there's lots of really, really uh, critical cartoons about that. He makes great fun of that. Um, in terms of prohibition, sorry? What about Spanish flu? Did he uh, did he do cartoons uh, that would have been the end of the war going in 1919? Really, really good question. I actually, I do talk a little bit about that. <laughs> no, there isn't one on the, on the Spanish flu. And of course this was, I mean, there's kind of debates on how many, have you ever had uh, Sarah Buchanan come and talk to you at the no, Vancouver? Okay, so. she, she wrote recently a really good piece on um, Vancouver and the and the Spanish flu. And I forget what year, but it was a, just a handful of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and she identifies through a more sustained research process that there was probably about 1,100 people who died in, in, uh, in, in the Vancouver area of, um, of the Spanish flu. He did not have one uh, in there. And that was probably, if I could just end this, that probably because of um, wartime censorship over media, there were lots of media controls that were put in terms of uh, over newspapers. And uh, the idea of um, the difficulty of this pandemic, I think, was, was um, submerged uh, by those controls. There's a question, uh, question here from John Fuller. Um, have you seen any Fitzmaurice cartoons of uh, pool room scenes? Portrayals of the highly popular game of pee pool, for example. Pee pool. <laughs> pee pool. That, never heard of that one before, but a pool room scene kind of. Um, yeah. Well, it kind of, yeah. Actually, um, I'd have to. I'd have to go back. But there are there are a, a handful of cartoons on pool um, and billiards. Um, from the billiard halls and pool halls, bars in the, in the downtown area that were produced um, in 1908 and 1909. Uh, and these usually appeared on the sports page, right? And they were, they often were um, uh, local uh, sports people that were portrayed within these. I, I don't think there were a lot of them, but I, see, I seem to remember a few of them, yeah. Oh, and, a, and a final question, um, you, you can't probably draw a straight line from Fitz to uh, late 20th century cartoonists, um, even, you know, our, our current cartoonists. 
Um, but what do you think is his legacy? Do you, do you, was he influential? Are you able to trace uh, <laughs> what he was doing as being the progenitor of a, cartoons later on? Mm. You know, I'll be co completely honest here. I haven't tried to kind of study his legacy. I do know that, that the first time I started to publish pieces on Fitzmaurice, no one else had ever heard of him. I went back through local uh, materials to look and see if um, if anyone had mentioned him, uh, like in the 1920s and 30s. There, there was a lot of talk when he died. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was a piece produced by Lou Skews, who um, was, a, was a cartoonist in the 1940s. He produced a little... Um, I don't remember. I think it was a, a little study of cartoonists uh, in Western Canada. Um, and he does mention Fitzmaurice in that. But really, there's, not, there's nothing that I could see on that. Now, we could change the word legacy <laughs> into the word, uh, you know, how, what's important about this? <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, he, he does, Fitzmaurice's cartoons really do um, they're a window into the past, um, and and there's so much important historical material contained within within these cartoons. They're just amazing. I mean, you can look at racism through these cartoons, and and I did in one of my one of the articles I produced for the Journal of Canadian Studies. You can look at at uh, anti. Uh, anti-woman perspectives and misogyny. They're absolutely in these cartoons, right? And, and his cartoons represent a certain middle class and privileged sector, you know, class uh, within, within the Vancouver thing. So, so it is a window into certain, certain aspects. And of course, my focus right now is on, on um, human attitudes towards animals. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, and as I mentioned, that is an emerging field of uh, study, uh, kind of part of environmental history. And so, you know, his cartoons really do kind of uh, reflect. There's, there's a bit of a connection between he has a sort of an everyman family mm -hmm. and, you know, particularly the idea of his own family with Horace. And he's and he's playing out the larger concerns through the lives of these little people. And that that's that, of course, is very Len Norris. Yeah, who, who was very Carl Giles and so on. Mm. Did he make a living from his cartoons? Helen sends in a question. Um, oh, that's a good question. What was I, the social status of him? Um, yeah, I think he did make a good living from from his job at the province. And remember, as I said at the beginning, it wasn't just doing cartoons. He also did illustrations. He also did advertising. He was, he was their visual editor, if you want to give him a title. Um, and, and so, yes, I, I believe he did. He was also involved in the formal art community in Vancouver as well. I think he was sitting on the board of one of the early... Um, art organizations, uh, you know, and um, mm. and he owned a nice house in Caresdale. <laughs> uh, and, um, and his wife, uh, Gladys, um, uh, and he had two daughters, you know, uh, and um, I don't think Gladys was working as far as I know. So I think he was a member of the middle class and he certainly had lots of good connections. When he died in January of 1926, there was, there was actually a fair bit of uh, writing, not just in the province, but in the Vancouver Sun and other newspapers about, uh, about him. And a lot of people attended his, his funeral as well. Oh, well, that is fascinating, and thank you for sharing this this wonderful study that you have done, and then also the rabbit holes that you're going down of uh, of looking at his cartoons as a window onto different attitudes of the time. And uh, I'd encourage everyone who's uh, who's watching to go to um, uh, Robin Anderson dot I want to say Open Ed, but I guess it's opened dot ca and uh, and have a look through and and. 
the, the way that we develop a visual literacy by looking at different images from different periods, I think is, is very important. We're saturated with images now and yeah. think back a hundred years and how few there were in the newspapers and so on. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Robin. This has just been a wonderful evening. And uh, if all of you can virtually give Robin a round of applause and, <laughs> uh, and we'll say good night. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this. Good luck to the boys of the